Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mireya Solis. I'm the Night Chair in Japan Studies here at Brookings. And it's a pleasure to welcome you to this panel on trade backlash and the WTO. We will address this afternoon a very important and timely topic, uh, the post-war economic order established by the Bretton Woods institutions is under growing stress. Um, obviously, in the course of 70 years, challenges have accumulated. The multilateral trading system has had to adjust to the larger weight of emerging economies, and more recently, it is confronted with deeper skepticism on the merits of globalization, now in many quarters of the industrialized world. The challenges are certainly steep. The world economy has experienced a slowdown of international trade growth, and one of the contributing factors is the lack of liberalizing initiatives. The negotiation logjam log in the WTO is well known, especially in light of the failure of the Doha round, although certainly that's not the entire picture because we have the trade facilitation agreement and ongoing plurilateral negotiations. But the inescapable fact is that it has not been possible to successfully conclude a multilateral round of trade negotiations for uh, quite a long time. And it's not only the negotiating arm of the WTO that is in the hot seat. While the WTO's dispute settlement mechanism is a major improvement over the GATT, frustrations have also grown in this area, certainly in this country where there have been complaints of overreach in the appellate body and where there is a new administration that seems more willing to rely on unilateral measures. So the challenges are steep. I cannot think of a more important conversation to be having today than the future of the multilateral trading system. And when we have to address these fundamental issues, I think then we really need to rely on the depth of expertise. And I feel very lucky that I have a terrific panel uh, for uh, all of us here today. Let me introduce our speakers in the order in which they'll come to the podium to make a brief presentation. Uri Dadush is a senior fellow at the OCP Policy Center and a non-resident scholar at Bruegel. He also teaches courses at the University of Maryland and his most recent book is titled WTO Accessions and Trade Multilateralism. Today, Uri will discuss the prospects for institutional reforms within the WTO and the implications of the Trump administration's trade policy on multilateralism. Scott Kennedy is deputy director of the Freeman Chair in Chinese Studies and director of the Project on Chinese Business and Political Economy at CSIS. His most recent book, a co-authored book, is titled Perfecting China, Inc., China's 13th Five-Year Plan. And Scott will talk today about the impact of China's rise as a major export powerhouse in the multilateral trading regime and the prospects uh, of the ongoing dispute regarding China's market economy status in the WTO. Christina Davis is professor of politics and international affairs at Princeton University in the Department of Politics and the Woodrow Wilson School of Public, uh, Public and International Affairs. Her most recent book is titled, Why Adjudicate? Enforcing Trade Rules in the WTO. And Christina will discuss the strengths, but also the sources of stress in the WTO's dispute settlement mechanism. And Yurizumi Watanabe has a long career as a Japanese diplomat and has been teaching at Keio University for over a decade. Watanabe san has been engaged in uh, mo the most important Japanese trade initiatives of the past years, and he's also been posted to Japan's diplomatic missions in Brussels and Geneva. Given that Japan has long been a beneficiary of the multilateral trading uh, regime, and that today there are greater expectations that Japan could play a larger role as an advocate, as a champion of free trade, Watanabe san will discuss Japan's policies towards the multilateral trading regime. So here it is, we have a very rich discussion and I'm sure time is going to fly. Without further ado, Uri, thank you. Yeah, good morning, good afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, delighted to be back at Brookings. And uh, Mireya, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, the uh, uh, 
So the best way I can describe my feelings about trade uh, these days is uh, unstable anxiety disorder. Um, following on November 8, 2016, my anxiety level rose markedly as TPP was buried. Shortly thereafter, it touched a maximum when a dangerous idea called the border adjustment tax was gaining traction and NAFTA seemed, head the, uh, seemed headed the way of TPP. Then I became a little calmer, less prone to panic attacks as various checks and balances on presidential action uh, kicked in. Executive orders now command the preparation of studies of why trade agreements are not working instead of commanding immediate departure from them. And that gives me a little hope. Sunday evening, I felt really good. Even France, my country, which in a sense invented mercantilism, a doctrine that has lost none of its appeal since the 16th century, elected a president who embraces globalization. Despite Brexit and the rise of the nationalist right, the European Union, the world's largest trading bloc, is not about to break up, at least not yet. And I'm not alone in feeling better. Not only are the stock markets booming, but the VIX index, which evaluates anxiety quite precisely in the financial market by measuring the cost of hedging, has reached the lowest level since 1993 the year before the Uruguay round was concluded and the WTO was, was launched. The IMF's forecast for the world economy, and I see John Lipsky here, um, over 2017 and 2018 calls for 3% growth at market exchange rates, which is essentially the 25-year pre-crisis average. After many years of subpar growth, due mainly, in my view, to cyclical factors, World trade growth is projected at 4% a year, much slower than the pre-crisis average, but well above uh, GDP growth. So, should we still worry? The answer is yes. First, as we have seen in the last 24 hours, Washington is full of surprises these days. <laughs> Second, because the administration is proposing tax cuts and increased infrastructure and defense spending, if cleared by Congress, this will amount to a substantial fiscal stimulus. This will occur against the background of full employment, rising interest rates, and a strong dollar. That's a textbook recipe for an increase in the trade deficit. John, am I right? And uh, uh, in 2018 and beyond, these big bilateral trade deficits with China, Germany, Japan, and Mexico that the administration does not like are more likely to become quite a bit larger in coming years instead of smaller. Something will have to give, and that something could be open markets. Third, and um, in a way the most important, although the less urgent, is that the rise in inequality is that very little is being done to address the root cause of the new protectionism which is the rise of inequality and the falling behind of less skilled workers. In fact, US fiscal policy, healthcare policies, education policies, and regulatory policies are currently oriented towards increasing, not reducing inequality. Given what's happening on the technological front, I'm willing to bet that in the future, the resistance to trade, even though trade may not be the main culprit, uh, will increase. Uh, in the medium term. So we are not out of the woods. The risk of a major trade backlash is still very much with us, and the world trading system has to be looked at against this rather uh, uh, dark background. So as Mireille has already said, the issues confronting the WTO have been widely discussed, they're well known, with the stall of the Doha negotiations launched over 15 years ago, I was in Doha full of hope 15 years ago, younger and full of hope. Uh, it's become evident that the mechanisms that generate uh, trade liberalization in eight previous successful rounds has broken down. 
The WTO settles trade disputes, but is allegedly losing its relevance because it is not able to adapt to the time. And while the Bush and Obama administration at least continue to pay lip service and even try to revive in a couple of contexts, the organization, the Trump administration, is challenging it frontally. Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross, USTR nominee Robert Lighthizer's, have complained, both complained about the WTO's dispute settlement, also mentioned by Mireya, as being biased against the United States and as inappropriately creating rules which could not be negotiated by, seted, by setting a judicial president, a precedent. Mr. Lighthizer has argued that the US is not legally bound by WTO rules, uh, rulings. Mr. Ross has argued that whereas the United States has bound its tariffs at very low level, many of its trading partners have not, and this puts the United States at a big disadvantage and explains, helps explain, uh, the big bilateral trade deficits. Economists who argue that bilateral trade deficits don't mean much in an integrated world and that the aggregate used trade deficit is due to a deficiency of national savings and or the desire of foreign, invest, of investors, to, to, uh, foreign investors, and investors to invest in the United States don't get much of a hearing. Mr. Ross has also argued that the value-added tax adopted by nearly all other WTO members discriminates against US exports and subsidizes the exports of other countries. This is factually incorrect, but the myth persists. The president even threatened to withdraw from the WTO during the campaign. And while such a move may be challenged in the courts, legal scholars believe that the president of the United States has the authority delegated by Congress to withdraw from any trade agreement, including the WTO, with six months notice. Now, how likely is the United States to withdraw from the WTO? Never say never, it's possible, but I think it's very unlikely. The blow to the United States regime, prestige and in the indirect effect on national security would be immense. Most concrete is, of course, the enormous stake that the United States has through its export industries and foreign investors, uh, uh, in uh, all of whom rely directly or indirectly on the openness and predictability of, of trade under WTO rules the ability of special interests, agriculture, automobile, et cetera, et cetera, to influence the Republican Congress is considerable. States that rely most heavily on exports, like Texas, hold key positions in committees that deal with trade. And presumably, if the United States withdraws from the WTO, it's to raise its own tariffs. This would also be resisted by retailers and producers that rely on imports as we have already seen in spades in their opposition to the border adjustment tax. So the US is unlikely to withdraw, but the prospect of four or eight years of immobility in the WTO are now almost assured. So what should they do? How should the big countries uh, react? To start with, the WTO needs to recognize that Doha is dead and that the all-encompassing, single undertaking, 160 country approach to negotiations does not work. Instead, modalities need to revolve around specific issues that a critical mass of countries can care, care deeply about, so-called plurilaterals. These should go forward, whether or not all WTO members want to participate. In some, in some instances, the rule should allow non-participants to derive the benefit of the agreement without taking on the obligations. In other cases, this free riding should be prevented. I believe that the Bali Trade Facilitation Agreement, which has been, uh, which has been billed as a multilateral deal, has so many flexibilities in it that it really resembles very closely a plurilateral. The organization also needs a new narrative, and that narrative, that narrative is possible as it is grounded in facts. It's true that 23 years have passed since the WTO was created and there's no uh, big multilateral deal. But these 23 years have seen great advantages in free trade through regional and bilateral deals and unilateral uh, liberalization, all of which I underscore 
depended directly or indirectly on WTO rules and disciplines. Two examples, the starting point of any bilateral deal are applied MFN tariffs in the WTO. Second example, if Britain leaves the EU without a trade deal, it will not wander for 40 years in the desert. It will revert to WTO disciplines. The WTO itself has made enormous strides in its capacity to regulate world trade. The accession to the institution of China and, some 35, and 35 other members expanded its coverage from about 80% of world trade to 98% of world trade. Even more important, the accession process, long and laborious as it is, anchored China's market reforms and that of all other Article 22 countries. Effectively applied tariffs in China, the United States, the EU, Japan, and in many developing countries have come down very significantly since 1994, even in the absence of a global deal. 500 or more disputes have been settled into WTO, maintaining orderly economic relations. Despite the financial crisis, protectionist measures have so far affected only about 5% of world trade, and even then, in most instances, the effect on specific sectors, with some exceptions, such as steel, has been minuscule. So, in closing, there are four policy implications from this short review, just telegraphically. Number one, the WTO must change its negotiating modalities. Number two, the European Union, China, and Japan must work together to ensure that the WTO's health and continuity while encouraging the United States to remain in the fold. Number three, American firms that depend on foreign trade and investment must make their voices heard. They must realize that they are much greater danger outside the WTO than inside the WTO. And last but not least, number four, all countries, beginning with the United States, need to re-examine the internal dynamics that cause the new protectionism. They must address increased inequality and marginalization through social policy instead of choking trade or technology, which are the wellspring of our prosperity. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, it's a delight to be here to talk about um, the WTO in China, even though uh, it's probably not going to be a very happy talk. Hopefully some of us, I think Yuri might be as most, most, most positive as sort of reminding us of all the positive things the WTO has done, but there's a great deal of frustration. And I want to say, uh, before I talk about China specifically, I just say uh, a, a, a few things to emphasize some of the points that, that he touched upon where there is our concerns. Uh, and I just want to highlight three very briefly. Um, the first uh, is, is that the WTO is a liberalization organization. It's dedicated, its mission is to liberalize trade. Uh, but uh, there, it allows for lots of exceptions. Uh, so there's lots of loopholes. Um, and uh, as China's joined the WTO, it's learned those loopholes. Uh, it learned not only the good about liberalizing, it learned the good about protection. Um, in addition, uh, some play better at the, these games than others, um, and there's patterns. The wealthier you are, the more lawyers you have, the better you are at using the WTO system to your advantage. Uh, but in addition to that challenge that the WTO has, um, it's clear that because it is a liberalization organization, that means it's not a development organization. And even though we think that development flows out of trade and generally supports it, they aren't uh, synonyms. They don't always do so, and uh, trade can create inequality. In addition, the WTO is not a jobs organization. And so even though trade may, in general, generate more jobs, it doesn't always. Sometimes uh, it leads to some con con uh, members getting more jobs than others. And so the WTO has no mandate to deal with these challenges of development and, and jobs, and that creates uh, stress and tensions in the system. Lastly, 
beyond the WTO, the global governance system has many, many loopholes. The WTO is about as comprehensive uh, as an organization can be, but it is the exception to the rule uh, in finance, investment, in technology. The institutions are far weaker and oftentimes uh, don't exist. So that puts, uh, creates more loopholes for, for countries uh, and members and companies to use. Uh, but it also means that uh, when there's a problem, folks blame the WTO for what are investment issues or things that wouldn't be under the WTO's responsibility in any case. So all those things put a lot of pressure on the WTO. Uh, and then you bring China into the mix uh, and the challenges get that much harder. Uh, integrating China into the WTO, it joined in December of 2001, was always going to be a challenge. First of all, just because China is so large. Um, as a large country, it's, it's uh, the reduction of tariffs for it, of re removal of non-tariff barriers, that was going to lead to a redistribution of, of wealth, of uh, supply chains, and that was going to create new winners and losers uh, who were going to feel a lot of angst simply because of this large new member. In addition, given the fact that China came uh, from a planned economy where state intervention is the, is the norm, not the exception, integrating China into a rules-based order where uh, states are not supposed to intervene except with exceptions is hard. Hard for China to learn that uh, because you have a large central government, you have many provincial governments, local governments, companies, lawyers, and others that have to learn those rules. And then it's also difficult for the incumbents because they have to learn what it's like to interact with an entirely new type of player. In addition to China, then you have India and all the others that Maria re referred to as well who are playing a bigger role. Now, um, this, in Integrating China challenge, uh, I think, has gotten harder over time, uh, but I don't think it was inevitable. Uh, under Jiang Zemin and Zhu Rongji, uh, the, the leaders who negotiated China's entry, um, I think you had these challenges of size and, and newness to deal with, but they were really committed to China's integration. Um, and they wanted the pressure of WTO to force domestic liberalization on China. Um, under Hu Jintao, their successor who took over just a year after China joined the WTO, uh, he was just faced with all of these commitments that China had to uh, absorb, and he wasn't going to just get up and run away from them. In addition, though, uh, he was a relatively weak leader. Um, he um, was pushed and pulled by a whole bunch of different forces amongst other leaders like Jiang Zemin, uh, and more conservative leaders, uh, by state-owned enterprises, by many different types of interests. And so he was pushed and pulled for his entire 10 years that he was in office. Uh, for the first uh, several years, for the first four years, uh, which was China's first, ended its first five years in the WTO, uh, China was basically given a pass by all the members in terms of how it uh, met, whether or not it complied with its commitments. But then in 2006, at the end of 2006, after five years, uh, the cases started to be filed against China and against Hu Jintao. And he did a very good job of, of encouraging the rest of the system to lawyer up, to deal with these WTO cases. And China gradually saw these cases being filed against it as sort of normal. They didn't, necess they didn't file a demarche and, and protests down Massachusetts Avenue because a case was brought. And they learned how to bring cases themselves. And China has brought a fair number of cases against the US and others. So they got, uh, it was basically learned uh, how to play within the system. And they're relatively constructive uh, in the Doha round, although you know, there's a debate about what happened in the summer of 2008, how much China gets the blame versus others. I, I don't, I play, I, I'm going to put the blame mostly on India, but nevertheless, you've got lots of competing forces. And I, don't, I think China would have signed a deal if they could have gotten everyone else to make a deal uh, in 2008. Nevertheless, more complicated because many different types of players. But I do think uh, under Xi Jinping, uh, who's been China's leader since late 2012, that China's approach toward the, its domestic economy and toward the WTO and the global system has changed uh, remarkably. Uh, this is not inevitable. I think it's because of him and the people he's appointed and their strategy. Uh, he does not believe in markets. Uh, to put it bluntly, he's a control freak. Uh, domestically, with regard to the economy, civil society, th the rest of the political system, and for China's role in the international system. 
And so he has utilized the tools of the WTO to protect China uh, and also to push, uh, to provide more leadership in the WTO, but also to push norms that help protect China Inc.'s uh, interests, uh, to make the WTO safe for Ch a China that uses industrial policy. Um, so if you look at the cases that China has faced in the DSU as a respondent at the WTO, it's faced uh, as, at the end of 2016, maybe there's a couple new ones since, uh, it was a respondent in 37 cases altogether. Now, that's about 7% of the total of the 514 cases that had been filed by then. Uh, and China's c contribution to world trade is about 8% over the lifetime of its being in the WTO. So relatively proportional. On the other hand, if you look at over time, since China was given a pass for the first few years of its membership, the proportion of cases over time has grown. So in the second five years of its membership, uh, even though China accounted for 8% of trade, 24% of WTO cases were filed against China. In the last five years, China accounted for 11% of trade, 20% of cases were against China. Now, who brings these cases against China? Well, uh, the EU brought 22% of the cases and the US over 50% of the cases. And that's very different than, even though the United States has been a respondent far more times than, than China, the dispersion of uh, the, the folks that bring cases against the United States is, is very wide. And that's because no one's afraid to bring a case against the United States. You don't think if you bring a case against the US that they're gonna retaliate somewhere else, but most folks think that's what China is gonna do. So it's left to the EU and, China, and the United States to bring cases against China. Most of the cases involving China are about its industrial policy, all the different aspects uh, from standards to, tr to trade remedies to subsidies, uh, cases which get at the heart of what is making China competitive. By contrast, cases against the US are primarily against our trade remedies regime to, to cushion the blow for steel, declining sectors, and such. Now, the results of the cases involving China are also interesting. Um, if you count not the, the WTO, those 37 cases, that's double counting because if several countries bring one case against China, for example, in rare earths, they count that as four cases if four countries signed on. But if we just go by the product uh, number of cases, there are 24 cases involving China, 18 of those are finished, 16 of those cases, China, by my count, the WTO doesn't issue a ruling that says this side won or that side won. You have to read the case, a very difficult legalese to do, uh, which gets the US Trade Representative and the Ministry of Commerce arguing over who won. But by my independent reading, 16 of the 18 cases went fully against China. Uh, and uh, in most of those cases, China has come into uh, legal compliance according to the letter of the law. But most of that efforts to come into compliance haven't had any commercial consequences that have been impactful on either China or the countries bringing the cases to begin with. In two examples where the decisions were entirely irrelevant, uh, the rare earths case in 2011 where China lost, it had asserted uh, the need to protect its environment to control exports of rare earths. Uh, the case was launched in part because China suddenly just banned rare earth exports to Japan. Um, and it took several years for that case to be resolved. Uh, by that time, the rarest industry had already totally moved along. The wind power sector, uh, uh, China lost a case because of its subsidies for the wind power industry. But by the time that case had been done, China had gone from its domestic companies having 15% of market share in China to having 85% of market share in China. Uh, and then there's other cases where they make a change in the law, but it really has no effect even though uh, there's still a chance that it could. Uh, the best example of that is the electronic payments case where China has protected China Union Pay, CUP, uh, in Lian, uh, its domestic monopoly and not let Visa, MasterCard, or Amex or anyone else compete in its domestic Renmin, the domestic market uh, against it. Uh, even though it's been recognized as a monopoly that, and a, the Chinese changed the rules to allow foreign companies to register, the process makes it so that you really can't register, so you really can't compete. So you can go to any ATM uh, in DC and see a China Union Pay logo and do business, and they can do business all around the globe, but there's not the same level of reciprocity in China despite the decision. Uh, th so 
the part of the frustration, uh, a lot of the frustration is that even if you use a WTO dispute system, you don't get the commercially significant changes uh, in Chinese economic policy that, that one should. Now, I still think that may be going a little bit too far because for me, the WTO should be a speed bump that doesn't keep everyone at 55, or I guess 65 is the is show, showing you my age, uh, what the speed limit should be, but keep you from driving 120. But it, China is still driving too fast, even with WTO disciplines. That brings us to the most recent case, China's market economy status. Um, China believes that as of December 12th last year, uh, every other WTO members should treat it as a market economy. I could read you the legalese of Article 15 of China's accession protocol where it, it looked like it states that. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, the United States, the EU, uh, haven't agreed. About 81 countries have already recognized China's market economy status, uh, which is relevant only for trade remedies cases and how you calculate the, the dumping margin. But the EU, EU and the US ha have not done so yet. And so on, dis on uh, December 12th, uh, China f uh, asked for consultations with both the EU and and with the US, and then in early March filed, uh, asked the WTO to create a body uh, to adjudicate the case against the EU. It didn't ask for it to do so against the US. I think that's because the WTO, the EU's law in this regard is weaker, it's easier to challenge. Uh, you, I could see the EU losing that case. The US case is more defensible, um, and I think it, it gets back to just sort of a philosophical principle, uh, not whether, uh, uh, Article 15D says what it says, but whether or not China is a market economy. Uh, and if you don't believe China is a market economy, use whatever definition you like, then I think the U.S. has a lot of, of leeway. Um, over the next, uh, we'll, we'll see how the EU case plays out. At some point, the China could decide to move on the, the U.S. I think that'll depend partly on negotiations that are occurring bilaterally. But I think regardless of what happens at the WTO, uh, this case of market economy status and China's overall relationship with the global trading system isn't going to be decided by lawyers uh, in, the, in any panel or in any appellate body. It's going to be decided by politicians in the different capitals because these issues are too big to leave to lawyers. I love lawyers, but they shouldn't have all the power in the world. Uh, there's others that should. And, but sometimes if you look at our politicians, you realize they shouldn't have all the power either. So uh, thank you very much and look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to have a chance to talk with you today. I'll be discussing how I see the WTO not only as a liberalization organization, as Scott has portrayed it, but also as a conflict management organization, helping countries to resolve their trade disputes in ways that can avoid trade wars, and that we really need to appreciate this important aspect of the WTO and how it is coming under strain. I have three questions. How well does the WTO solve the problems that are brought before it? Even more ambitious, how well does it prevent future disputes? And finally, how is it going to deal with change and ad adaptation? I'll be looking at effectiveness on two dimensions, thinking about policy change. Can you change the trade barrier that is impinging on your expert opportunities? and deterrence, which is this core idea that a legal system, if it's credible and working, will lead people to adapt behavior and not violate the law. Overall, I'll be showing that the WTO has a fairly good record at solving the cases that are being brought before it, and we do see a decline in complaints over time. I'll try to convince you the declining number of complaints is a sign of strength and not of weakness, but that is challenging to prove, so I imagine we'll spark debate. I do see the system as facing strain, and I'd like to talk about the challenge of how can you have a legal system enforcing rules that are unable to keep up with the times and the tensions that that gives rise to, especially when the backlash is from the largest player in the system. Starting off, if we think about why you would even bother using an international trade court, after all, there's no trade police, and the United States or other countries can retaliate without a legal ruling. So why do they need to go to court to have a ruling and authorization? Really, the process is much more about information. 
and less about, um, yes, the legal interpretations do matter, and authorization of retaliation is an important stick at the end of the process. But I argue that a lot of what helps the WTO be effective is that it's a screening process for countries to communicate with each other about their trade problems. Frankly, the United States or Japan or Europe or China have a ton of problems where somebody thinks their exports are being discriminated against. And if every time there is a problem, there is a tweet, there is a barrier, and there's a retaliation, we will have a proliferation of trade wars. So it is very important for countries to sort through their trade problems, and this is where the act of filing a formal complaint based on law, but also sorting through where is there a combination of economic and political interest that makes it worth pursuing that legal case. And so even the United States, with all of its problems, only files a few cases a year. And so the act of which cases do you file helps to convey where our trade priorities are. And that's especially so for other countries, where they can really try to give a priority to the one or two issues that are critical for their export industries, whether that's a major trade stake or a politically important industry. And so this helps countries to bargain better because now they know it's cleared that threshold of importance. There's a legal claim that's defensible and there's a political economic interest at stake. And of course, it also helps that you can declare you have sued your trade partner. You're taking action against these violations. And uh, President Obama was not the first, nor will he be the last, to stand in front of a trade representative saying, we have filed cases against China. We are taking action and we are being tough. And that public nature of the dispute system is also important. It becomes the lightning rod for a lot of these difficult issues. Um, but that is also the strain. Now, as I said, it doesn't actually mobilize a new retaliatory power, because you could retaliate without the law. But winning a legal ruling in a multilateral body certainly mobilizes new pressures, because you now have an international stake in compliance that is brought by reputation, some sense that you shouldn't be a scofflaw violating international rules right and left. So generally, these are the reasons why we should expect that the WTO rules are going to help countries to solve their disputes. And it's especially important to think about what's the right comparison. So, so often we just think about the observed WTO and it's not working well enough. But you have to think about what's the alternative. Would we have gotten a better result by doing a bilateral negotiation? And I think often that alternative is getting lost. And so I'd like us to look at that carefully. All right, so I'm going to give you a very short synopsis of my book, Why Adjudicate. If you're interested, read the full thing. I'll give you the short um, highlights. What I do is to try and tackle this question of whether the WTO is getting better outcomes by looking at the effectiveness of the system for the United States. Now, President Trump has argued that we need to go and look through all of our trade partners and see where the trade agreements are helping the United States or not and if violations are working or not. Actually, this has been done for a long time. So the Congress mandated the National Trade Estimate Reports back in 1974, and every year the USTR faithfully publishes a very long, thorough investigation of what trade partners do that is harming US exports. And it highlights where those are expected to be a violation, where they're just a problem, and what is being done about them. So it's nice as a laundry list of problems. And this is a way to try and think of that comparison. How do our WTO complaints stack up against all these other problems that didn't quite make it to the WTO forum? So in my book project, I went through and coded for the first 10 years of the WTO. If you look at our top trade partners, 328 of the major trade barriers, a small handful are being brought to the WTO. So only 41 of these industry-specific trade barriers were brought to the WTO, 12% of the total sample that I'm looking at. But this allows me to try and compare how did those WTO cases do relative to the others that were negotiated outside. And overall, they do pretty well. 76% of them have the US Trade Representative's Office reporting progress towards removal of the barrier, complete removal in some cases. And that's compared to 50% for those that were just being negotiated at the bilateral level. Now, it's important to think about this. 76% means not all are solved. So there are WTO cases. You go through all the legal briefs, you mobilize everything, and nothing happens. And that's where the press focuses its attention. 
but getting progress on most of the cases is pretty good. And the attention that if you compared it to the alternative, you might have had a worse outcome. Now, of course, we're also worried about how long did it take to get that outcome. I mean, after all, the Boeing dispute, it took from 2004 to 2011 to get a ruling, and now we're still in compliance rulings. So you could say this is just too long. But again, we might be forgetting there was another 20 years before that of bilateral negotiations where Europe continued to ramp up the level of subsidies. So it's not necessarily obvious that the alternative to the WTO was going to be stopping all of those subsidies because the bilateral negotiations did nothing to slow them down, let alone stop them. So at face value, it appears like there's a pretty good record. Um, I did conduct a more rigorous statistical analysis where I try to control for is it a high trade value product? Is it one with a lot of political stakes? Um, and even with the better statistical analysis, I can show that if anything, harder cases go to the WTO. I mean, after all, you don't bother going to court for something that would have been easy to solve. And so when you take into account all the difficulties of these cases, the fact that most of them are being solved is really quite remarkable. So the overall increase in the likelihood of getting progress is 28 percentage point increase if you use the multilateral as opposed to the bilateral. So you'd think if it's working so well in the first 10 years, why are there less cases? My work is disappearing. It used to be there were 40 cases a year and now there's 20 cases a year. Does it mean that this system is not working? Well, I'm going to try and convince you, and I know my time's running out, so I'll be quick, that actually there may be a silver lining to declining cases, that there is some deterrence in the system. Not complete, but some. So what would deterrence look like in the legal system? It would mean that by enforcing each case of violation, you're showing that we are monitoring everyone's trade policies, and that when there's a violation that's serious enough, we'll take you to a public court, lead through the process possibly to retaliation. And that should lead to other countries reforming their policies ex ante, or at least pulling them down quickly when the embassy has a discussion and not necessarily force everyone to go through the entire rigmarole of the court case every time it comes up. Precedent effect is the hope that you would clarify the law. So sometimes disputes are an honest misunderstanding. Trade agreements are not precise. And so again, each case as jurisprudence. You understand better how it works. And so we could also see this cumulative building of understanding that would lead to less cases, because we know it works better. So the motivating example for me was actually, I was walking around with some friends in the Japanese Ministry of Agriculture, and they were telling me about a study group on WTO dispute settlement. And they were looking at the cotton case, where Brazil filed against US cotton subsidies. I was like, why does the Japanese agriculture ministry care about this case? But they were revising their subsidies law, and there was some obscure provision in the WTO panel ruling about what counts as a subsidy, and if you mandate it's for vegetables, that is trade distorting. And so other countries are watching that jurisprudence, and they're thinking about it as they revise their own laws. That is the ideal of rule clarification, deterrence. But it may not be very common. Um, so the other good example of possibility of spillover is Jeff Kusick and Christoph Pelk have found that when the US won a ruling against a Canadian policy on a feed-in tariff for solar panels, there were market effects on solar panels in India. Because investors figured India has the same exact feed-in tariff that has just been found in violation against Canada. And so this is going to hurt India. And sure enough, you saw that spillover in the market reaction. And we see the WTO appellate body and its rulings about precedent say, we need to be consistent because the members are trying to conform with the law. So there's this sense that there is precedent, that countries do look at rulings and do act to change their laws. So if that's true, it means that states actually want to comply and that they are following cases and trying to update their policies. We can hope that that is true. Um, it is ambitious for a system to work in this way, and perhaps it is a rare case, um, but it could be one explanation for some decline in the disputes. So I look at which agreements do we see having decline in disputes? Because frankly, I think bureaucrats are more likely to update their understanding of the law and just fix things. And so it's the technical agreements where we'll see this process happening more. The new agreements where, yes, there was a lot of uncertainty. 
less likely to happen for trade remedies, where we all know it's pretty politically driven by an industry that's harmed. And this is what I do see when I look at which agreements have the linear decline in cases citing those agreements. You know, the general rules of GATT on non-discrimination national treatment generally is the following decline that there's been less every year in the number of cases citing those types of violations. We also see that the new agreements, they're less overall, but also it's overall declining. And the standards agreements have had a general decline. While the remedies are all over the map, they respond to political pressures, macroeconomic conditions. Um, so that's tentative evidence that where countries have more control, where there was more legal uncertainty, you see a decline of cases. This is the picture of the overall pattern of all the cases that are being filed, looking at the GATT to the WTO. What's really interesting is under the GATT system, there was an increasing number of complaints being filed. I mean, this is the strains of the system as there's more and more violations, more and more cases, building up to 1995 with the WTO, and everyone now is excited. We have a new legal system where you can't vi uh, veto the panel, and you see a surge of cases. Some are backlog cases. Some are trying out the new system. But since then, there's been this decline, and... As I say, the question is, you know, is it because of dis discontent or effectiveness? And I believe from my earlier research that generally countries are getting better outcomes from the WTO. There are anecdotal evidence cases that they are looking at the rules, updating their understanding of the law. And so I would say the decline of cases may be a sign of hope. But we may see a surge back to more cases going forward because we have this problem of the rules are not adapting. And so now you're getting more and more problems where you've got new trade issues and you're trying to apply the old rules. And this is likely to generate new problems. We might see a surge in a new type of case that are really going to push the margin of the system. You know, we already can see where you need rule clarification. The trade remedies that generate so many WTO disputes, can't seem to get around that need to revise the remedy rules rather than have it be litigated, litigated, litigated. We've also seen environment and labor standards where ideally you would have had a new agreement that would clarify how do you regulate processes when the product will look the same. The WTO appellate body has been trying to allow creative solutions, leaving a lot of deference to countries on this point. And so I'm not sure if it's quite as broken as the NGO groups portray, but nonetheless, it's been a source of tensions. Real challenge is the state-owned enterprise issue with what is a public body and how do you define subsidies? And this is going to be a real problem with the United States backlash against the treatment of China. Border tax, obviously looming on the agenda. Now, all of these are areas where you would want rules to clarify rather than a third party judgment deciding. But because the Doha round has failed, we aren't getting any rule clarification. And the only way forward to clarify the rules would be a new trade round that would fully revise the system, but that seems unlikely, certainly in these times and not in a timely manner. The second would be to amend the rules. There are processes with two thirds of the governments, you can revise the rules. And yet the very first one was just concluded this January when two thirds of the members ratified the TRIPS amendment for access to medicines. But that was a 2003 agreement. It took this long to get the rules amended. So that's not a big solution. Um, and so what is happening is the third option, which is the court is being forced to try and fill these gaps. And that's what's leading to charges of judicial activism from the United States and concerns in other quarters about legitimacy of the trade rules. Um, so I think this is the real friction of the WTO dispute settle settlement system going forward. And we see alternatives to the WTO dispute sy system in the regional agreements. TPP was trying to strengthen and innovate on how you design dispute settlement by going to a compensation option. Um, we've also seen new unilateral options. Let's go through one by one our trade partners' trade balances. Perhaps that's the new way to solve trade disputes. Um, I'm a little concerned about the bilateral turn for a couple of reasons. One is that we've seen most of our bilateral free trade agreements do not have strong dispute settlement. They might in design have dispute settlement, but countries don't use it. And there's also a reason why it's difficult to use bilateral agreements for hard enforcement. Often you have more geopolitics at the bilateral level because it becomes just the two countries. 
as strong as President Trump has been towards China and saying that in his first trade policy agenda issued by USTR that there would be no putative geopolitical benefits from bilateral deals, the first issue was to not label it a currency manipulator and to bargain for North Korea cooperation from China in exchange for better trade terms. When it's bilateral, there's much more pressure to make those types of trade-offs of geopolitics for trade. Whereas in the multilateral setting, you may actually find it easier to focus on broader rules, broader um, gains across the system. The plurilateral option is promising and that it's easier to get there, but it leaves all the hard issues like agricultural subsidies or trade remedy rule revision outside. And I'm a little worried that if you get all the industry solutions for information technology and the easy things solved in a plurilateral, you'll never get those hard issues resolved and the WTO dispute system will be left as the only enforcement game in town with rules that are not being updated. So I hate to end on a grim note, but in conclusion, the WTO has worked well. It might prevent conflict, but the system will erode unless we give it a new source of energy. Okay, well, um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, uh, many thanks uh, certainly go to uh, Mireya. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. Um, it is a great honor and pleasure always uh, for me to be here at this uh, institution. And also, my thanks also go to audience because uh, you have been busy rather watching TV, the breaking news by CNN or ABC or whatever uh, about this, um, uh, the, the thing that happened yesterday. I was quite astounded too, uh, just upon the arrival. So uh, I had a very short sleep actually, and uh, 3 p.m. Uh, in the Washington time is a very hard, challenging time for me. Um, the, uh, I'd like to uh, start with uh, the uh, kind of recollection of uh, the uh, functioning of the GATT and WTO. Uh, first thing is that uh, GATT uh, as an uh, international treaty. And here is the rule uh, book of the international trade policies. And also that provides legally binding international uh, contract for the members. And also, by virtue of the single undertaking, uh, this provides very comprehensive uh, rules, uh, not only rules, but also letters and spirit uh, governing international trade. And uh, um, the secondary, the, uh, the one of the major function is uh, GATT WTO has been functioning as a forum uh, for trade negotiation for quite some time. Uh, tariff reduction exercise, as well as rule making, and um, uh, we had uh, eight successful rounds uh, under the GATT and uh, one painful experience under WTO Doha Development Agenda. And thirdly, uh, the GATT WTO uh, has a function of international organization, which is also uh, quite uh, important, uh, particularly uh, you know, in the sense that this organization functions very well with a fairly small scale of uh, the Secretariat. Uh, total number is something like 650, including all the uh, general service people. And uh, there are uh, slightly more than 200 professionals working on the uh, trade issues, trade policy issues. And uh, in comparison with other Bretton Woods institutions, uh, this organization is fairly small, uh, but uh, efficient uh, Secretariat. And also the good record of uh, litigation mechanism that uh, Christina has already explained. And uh, her talk was uh, extremely persuasive that I want to buy the book and maybe uh, introduce the book to my Japanese students. And also to the MOFA officials as well, perhaps. Um, 
and uh, um, over f more than 500 cases uh, with more frequent uh, use by developing countries. That's also a very important element. And uh, decision making of that organization by consensus. Uh, but in the good old days of the GATT, we have a more kind of uh, uh, flexible uh, consensus. I still remember at the Punta del Este, uh, the Brazilians and Indians are all against inclusion of the new issues such as services, intellectual properties, and investment measures. But uh, they said that they, are, they were are still uh, opposed to the inclusion of new uh, issues, but th they were ready to join the consensus. You see, this is what they said at the Punta del Este. But that kind of uh, uh, flexibility and consensus has been rather missing in the WTO DDA, and that was the major cause of the failure of having uh, meaningful results out of uh, DDA. Um, the, here, I'd like to just introduce the brief history of Japan's uh, membership in GATT and WTO. Japan joined in 1955, and at that time, uh, the only supporter of Japan's uh, membership to GATT, it was only uh, the was United States. And uh, all other uh, Western uh, countries, West European countries in particular, like uh, Great Britain and France, and others, um, uh, they all applied this Article 35, which was actually the veto uh, to the newcomer of the general agreement. So Japan left behind uh, without having this uh, um, most favored nation treatment, neither national treatment uh, provided by those countries. Uh, so, you know, Japan uh, has only United States as um, United States as a kind of uh, open market for its export in the uh, 1950s up to uh, the mid of 1960s. And in order to cope with that kind of difficulties, the voluntary export restraints uh, have been introduced to mitigate trade frictions with the US and the EEC. And the first instance of Japanese exercise on voluntary export restraints, that was on cotton textiles in 1955. And uh, uh, the last uh, case for the uh, VER, uh, that was on autos, uh, the uh, passenger vehicles, and that ended up um, uh, by 1995. And also, the, uh, there was a behind the scene sort of fight at the Punta del Este, where the Uruguay round was uh, uh, launched in September 1986, the discussion about uh, balance of benefits. Um, uh, the balance of benefits of the, uh, do you remember, right? The, that was the kind of behind the scene, you see. Uh, the major argument was whether, you know, they could, should include the new area issues such as services and intellectual properties, but uh, that was also an issue. And uh, that could give us some idea how we look at uh, China's accession uh, since uh, 2001 um, in WTO. And uh, it's interesting to note that uh, Japan's first and only one recourse uh, to the GATT dispute settlement uh, in 1988, uh, that was the uh, EC's imposition of anti-dumping duties to what they called screwdriver investment on electric uh, scale. And that is only one case. Is, uh, after 33 years uh, of Japanese accession, uh, the, uh, uh, that was the only one case that uh, uh, Japan brought uh, the other member of the GATT to the uh, dispute settlement in the GATT. And uh, since 1995, after the uh, establishment of WTO, Japan was the uh, original member. So uh, the mindset of uh, Japanese government towards WTO has been quite changed. I mean, uh, beforehand it was more passive, but uh, after uh, WTO it's more positive kind of thing. Um, and the, finally, the uh, uh, year 2001 and beyond, uh, the Economic Partnership Agreement, which is Japanese version of free trade agreement, uh, EPA as a complementary approach uh, to trade liberalization together with uh, WTO Avenue for trade liberalization. So let me uh, touch upon Japan's FDA EPA strategy, particularly in the area of Asia Pacific and beyond. Um, that was uh, considered to be kind of de facto business driven integration, uh, had been um, quite uh, phenomenal since uh, the, um, uh, the Praza Accord 
of September 1985 in order to mitigate the negative ramifications of uh, much um, appreciated Japanese yen. Uh, so many Japanese companies made a for, uh, for foreign direct investment, FDI, uh, to the neighboring uh, ASEAN countries and also uh, some other East Asian countries uh, such as uh, Taiwan, China, Korea, and so forth. And they developed this supply chain and production network. So in order to cover, uh, not only uh, cover this uh, uh, supply chain, but also to uh, consolidate the merits of having supply chain and production networks in the region, uh, FTAs and EPA that uh, uh, Japan uh, introduced little by little. And uh, uh, those um, uh, bilateral FTAs, EPAs, um, now developed to a wider regional FTA, EPA, such as ASEAN Plus 6, which is now uh, the format of RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, comprising 16 countries, as well as uh, Japan, China, Korea, trilateral FTA. Uh, those are being negotiated uh, since 2013. And beyond regional FTA, EPA, Japan has been moving, and uh, Japan joined the TPP negotiations uh, in uh, July 2013. So TPP is an uh, inter-regional uh, FTA, uh, and the other uh, inter-regional FTA is uh, Japan-EU uh, EPA. Uh, we have already Japan-China EPA to bridge East Asia and Europe and most probably Japan-EU EPA might be successfully concluded uh, towards the end of uh, July. I hope uh, that will be the case. So this is the list of uh, bilateral uh, FTA EPAs that Japan have so far concluded. There are 15 of them, and that covers uh, roughly 23% of Japan's external trade. And uh, this is the um, uh, substance of Japan's EPA. Uh, it covers not only trading goods, a very traditional part of FTA, but also trading services, investment, uh, government procurement, uh, and also some uh, area called um, the improvement of uh, uh, business environment, uh, and so forth. So. Uh, um, these are quite comprehensive, uh, going beyond traditional FDA. So this uh, slide is to show you or give you some idea that uh, uh, Japan has uh, so far concluded 15 bilateral EPAs, maybe now moving on to two directions. One is uh, East Asia uh, by using this RCEP framework, uh, Regional Comprehensive economic partnership, which is essentially ASEAN plus Japan, China, Korea. In addition, we have uh, Australia, New Zealand, and India. And this is more of integrational sort of approach. While uh, uh, going to the Pacific Rim, we have TPP and also uh, Japan, Canada, uh, bilateral EPA under negotiations. And those uh, RCEP, uh, together with TPP and uh, existing bilateral EPAs will bring us all to FTAAP, which is a free trade area of Asia Pacific. So uh, Japan uh, could play a very important kind of pivotal role between TPP and RCEP. And in this way, uh, if you look at this picture, uh, we have three mega regions like the European Union and uh, uh, NAFTA for North America and Mercosur, Alianza del Pacifico for the southern part of the uh, American continent, and we have East Asia. So those are three mega regions which, co consider, uh, which could be considered as um, uh, gross poles. And uh, between those uh, gross poles or mega regions, uh, we have uh, inter-regional cooperation frameworks such as APEC, and ASEM, ASEM is Asia-Europe meeting, and we have transatlantic marketplace or transatlantic um, marketplace or economic council uh, existing since 1995. But uh, it's interesting to note that after 2010 uh, or so, uh, we have um, uh, the, those inter-regional cooperation framework being developed into full-fledged uh, free trade agreement uh, inter-regional uh, FTA, such as TPP, Japan EU EPA, and TTIP. And of course, you know, the, we have difficulties in uh, pursuing the TPP in its original format, and also TTIP also uh, uh, st somewhat stagnating, particularly because of the uh, uh, 
the political ear uh, of uh, Europe and also some reluctance on the part of uh, uh, new US administration. But we will see the, what will happen. So um, today I'd like to deliver particularly this message. I think the uh, Japan's uh, trade policy um, is um, uh, maybe um, multilateralize the mega FTAs. And uh, there are three reasons. One is the systemic reasons. Uh, from non-binding cooperation to fully binding high-level FTAs. So we have seen it already. And uh, functional approach, functional uh, reasons from regional production network to uh, develop into global uh, value chain by making new rules on investment, competition, and government procurement. And finally, institutional reasons. Um, we can gather like-minded developing countries to shape the critical mass as we did in the Uruguay Round days. Um, multilateralizing regionalism, um, I'd like to make uh, three points. Uh, this is the uh, kind of convergence of liberalization efforts in three mega FTAs, TPP, TTIP, and the Japan-EU EPA. Secondly, a new momentum to reinforce the trade multilateralism embodied in the WTO through this convergence of uh, mega FTAs. And Japan and the United States uh, should demonstrate uh, leadership in TPP and beyond. So concluding remarks from Japanese perspectives, uh, bearing in mind what I have said, um, the TPP-12 uh, continuously serve as a template for 21st century uh, type trade agreements. And in practice, uh, Japan would be uh, determined to go ahead with t this idea of TPP, uh, even uh, with the uh, uh, US absence. Uh, so TPP-11 to keep the momentum for freer trade while keep the door open for United States to come back to original TPP. And uh, thirdly, uh, RCEP and uh, JCK or CJK uh, trilateral FTA for uh, updating its production network in East Asia. And Japan-EU EPA, the only surviving uh, regional mega uh, interregional mega FTA to be concluded without any further due. So uh, in this way, uh, to, uh, we, we could perhaps uh, re reinvigorate trade multilateralism embodied in the WTO, and thus to maintain predictability in international business. So uh, thank you very much indeed, and very much looking forward to the discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Those were uh, really extremely insightful presentations, and I know that there must be many questions from the audience, and I appreciate your patience. So I'm going to limit myself to just one question to begin, but if you give me a chance, I certainly can jump with uh, more questions. Um, you know, and I want to talk about uh, the interaction between China and the United States and what that means for the WTO. And what I mean is that many of China's uh, mercantilist practices uh, you know, the advantages that state-owned enterprises have and that have sometimes resulted in um, overcapacity, the lack of reciprocity in investment access, many of the things that Scott uh, highlighted are not well covered by the WTO rulebook. That comes with the inability to update uh, the rules. But uh, on the other hand, what we have heard recently from the new U.S. administration is that they are more willing to try unilateral measures and one in particular I think caught a lot of attention, and that is the decision to launch a study on the potential use of Section 232 to limit uh, imports on steel and aluminum based on their impact on national security. And that I think created some concern because that could then give rise to uh, escalatory uh, uh, dynamics, escal an escalation of retaliatory uh, measures. So um, I think we can imagine the fallout if there is this interaction between uh, Chinese mercantilism and U.S. unilateralism. And to borrow from phrases that I heard uh, both of you, some of you mentioned, 
the interaction of, say, a control freak Xi Jinping and unpredictable Trump, and that, what that would mean for the multilateral trading um, system. So uh, I think none of us wants to go there. So how can we prevent this a scenario? Are there more effective strategies in which the United States could encourage genuine reform from China that still abide by a multilateral rules-based system? Are there unilateral measures that the United States could pursue that nevertheless would not be as disruptive as using national security as grounds for uh, restricting imports? How do we solve this, I think, tension between the two largest economies in the world as they're played out in the WTO uh, setting? Whoever wants to take that one. <laughs> Scott, I volunteer sure. you. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm, I'm volunteered for many things, I'm, and I'm happy to, to take a first crack at this. Um, I want to say that um, the f frustration that uh, I and a lot of others feel about the WTO, perhaps uh, misplaced, and the frustration that you, we have against on, on China uh, aren't syn synonymous with each other. There are a lot of things that the WTO is doing right, mm -hmm. uh, that it should be doing, and we should try to protect it and, and, and strengthen it, not walk away from it. So I think any solution uh, involving China needs to, the WTO has to be part of the solution in, in protecting it. I would say, though, that there's going to be things that you need to do in addition to it, and it's not an either or, it's an and, I, th I think. Mm -hmm. So to some extent, um, I mean, I think uh, we, we stole defeat from the jaws of victory when we walked away from TPP, right? Now, you can blame the, the Trump administration for hammering the last nail in the coffin or putting it on ice, but the Obama administration could have conclude, helped conclude it more quickly, uh, could have made a more vigorous effort to get it through Congress uh, once the, treaty, the deal was signed in October of 2015. Uh, so, uh, there, and so Democrats and Republicans all, all share part of the, the blame, and the, sp the last three issues that folks cited probably as a proportion of the total benefits from the deal were these small little things uh, involving drugs and financial uh, uh, financial services and things. that If people had the political commitment, they could have gotten over those. But TPP, uh, the best way to negotiate with China is to not negotiate with China. It's to create rules uh, that uh, China needs to uh, come into compliance with or be uh, at a competitive disadvantage and, and address, and also at the same time, fill in all those gaps in global governance, uh, which are so thorny, particularly with regarding to investment. So I think actually most of the big challenges that you hear people say against China are, are about the difficulties of investing in China, the ownership caps, uh, the, mark, the areas that you can't invest in China, which aren't covered by the WTO. So I think uh, TPP, regional arrangements, uh, critically important. I do also think that there could be some unilateral steps. I'm not in favor of, of looking for a uh, legal fig leaf like 232 uh, to slam China. It's, it's too obvious, right? Uh, we had the uh, special safeguards case in 2002. The US lost that, uh, which was a probably stronger legal case than 232. Uh, I think it was 427, I forget. There's a bunch of three-digit uh, numbers in US trade law we're all gonna become familiar with. Uh, in the next year or two. Uh, I, if it was me, I think I would focus on investment, uh, investment constraints, because there are a lot less constraints. You, you can uh, more legally uh, limit Chinese investment in the United States or, or have it run through more review processes uh, without uh, at all coming into potential violation of WTO commitments. So last year, China invested $46 billion in the United States, $9 billion of which was by state-owned enterprises. I think uh, you could be drastic and just stop all new SOE investment, or you could push those, have more rigorous pr review procedures for them, either within CFIUS or a new type of, of, of process, uh, which I think would be reasonable. Uh, just one last thing is... Um, you know, all throughout uh, U.S. trade law history, in fact, uh, has been the idea of reciprocity and fairness. Not equivalent requirements, but a sense of fairness. And I think you could do the, the I've done a little bit of reading on this. Um, it, uh, reciprocity doesn't mean e equality. It means some, some sense of proportional fairness. Uh, and the U.S. first treaty it signed with France 
uh, has reciprocity as part of it. The GAT has reciprocity written into several of its uh, components. It's not in the, the, w, the new WTO agreements. And uh, legal compliance uh, is, is fine as a standard as long as the, the distance between legal compliance and what the members think of as fair is relatively narrow. And I think what's happened over time is that gap between legal compliance and what people think is fair is widening. And so either you have to change the rules uh, to get that distance, to shrink that distance, or you're going to see a lot of these unilateral actions. And so I, th I think that's the challenge where we are right now. Great, thank you. Any other comments uh, from the panel? I completely agree. TPP would have been a powerful tool, um, both as uh, setting the standard that China could aspire to and creating the right incentives. But short of having the TPP as a pressure point, the Trump administration's threats of unilateralism perhaps have some positive effect because the danger during the Doha round was many countries felt the WTO was strong and was a good fallback and the Doha round could fail and the status quo would persist. And we no longer think the status quo can be taken for granted. And so that may help the Chinese government realize that it will need to step up to take leadership. Um, I think there's been advocates of a Beijing round, that the next trade round needs to have China take a lead role because it actually has the biggest stake in the system. And maybe it will now appreciate that because of all the uncertainty created by the Trump administration. Very, very interesting. Um, if you don't have any comments, I would like to br other comments bring the audience. Um, we have a microphone. Um, if you can raise your hand, and when the microphone comes to you, if you can identify yourself. May I? May I? Oh, yes, yeah. of course. Sorry. Um, I'd like to uh, somewhat uh, correspond mm -hmm. or uh, respond to uh, what uh, you asked mm -hmm. uh, to the panels. Sure. Um, the, uh, you know, the, when I look at uh, the Japanese experience of losing many cases in the gap dispute settlement, um, those uh, lost cases, uh, you know, uh, was it uh, negative or positive to Japanese economy, uh, Japanese uh, well-being? Uh, even lost cases uh, brought a lot of benefit to the Japanese economy. Mm -hmm. And I can give you some example. For instance, uh, uh, in order to protect uh, this uh, uh, white liquor called shochu, mm -hmm. you know yes, it, right? Yes, I know shochu. It's too strong. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You know, they have uh, domestic duties on shochu uh, kept much lower than the uh, imported liquor, uh, like whiskey and brandy. And uh, European Union, uh, European com uh, communities at that time uh, brought this case to the WTO, uh, uh, even previously to the GATT. And we lost the case. But thanks to this lost case, you know, the, those uh, shochu producers really they did their enormous efforts to uh, improve the quality of shochu. And uh, uh, this also went uh, to uh, some other segment, like uh, Japanese rice wine, sake mm. market also improved. They are uh, more seriously, seriously producing better quality of sake, better quality of shochu. So the, you know, the Japanese uh, uh, populations certainly uh, should be grateful to European commissions, you know, uh, bringing this issue to uh, uh, the gap dispute settlement. Uh, so what I want to say is uh, uh, those dispute settlement, um, you know, maybe it's a, uh, it's a defeat for bureaucracy. It's a defeat for much protected uh, segment. But I think the, uh, you know, the, uh, it is all, all together and after all very, very positive for uh, domestic economies. And uh, what China has been doing is quite uh, similar. I think uh, uh, they have been accused, uh, you know, uh, and their measures found uh, uh, in violation of the WTO rules. Uh, but uh, they are quite uh, determined to bring those issues back into conformity with WTO rules. I think their performance is quite remarkable. Uh, so uh, I have to, uh, well, we have to look at kind of uh, domestic politics uh, in Beijing that uh, there are some part of Chinese uh, uh, administration, they like to um, abide by WTO rules, international rules, but they are also confronted with uh, very 
uh, strong opposition within the same country. So I think it is important that we keep bringing those issues of China if they are really inconsistent with WTO rules. We have to keep bringing those issues into WTO. And then uh, this is uh, to encourage those uh, uh, segments of people within Beijing uh, that, uh, you know, like-minded people to uh, keep conformity with international commitment that China has previously uh, committed. So I think the, we should not worry too much about the consequence, but we have to bring those issues uh, into WTO, International Court of Justice for Trade. Thank you. Thank you very much, Watanami. So now the image of the shochu producers has been imprinted <laughs> <laughs> when I think about the, uh, the domestic politics of trade. So that was really uh, great. Uh, questions from the audience? Just wait for the mic. This gentleman here, please. Together in Geneva. Oh, uh, uh, Jean-François Watin from uh, CEPI, a French economic think tank in Paris. And I have two questions. And the first one is about uh, Professor Watanabe's uh, uh, allusion to the balance of benefits uh, debate in uh, Punta del Este, where the EU, as EC at the time, was uh, widely ridiculed for the, introducing the debate. But the debate had an impact, because I can remember vividly a few years later, about two years before the end of the round, the Japanese ambassador in Geneva saying, now in Japan we say, GATT has been good to us, now it's time to be good to GATT. And I'm wondering whether China now is in a position to adopt that very position of being good to the WTO. Because it's one thing for the president uh, to say in Davos that uh, the WTO is a great thing, but the uh, behavior of Japanese, of uh, sorry, Chinese negotiators uh, uh, in the last years in the Doha round have not been up to uh, that uh, standard. And my second question is how the members of the panel would uh, estimate the risk of the WTO being a, a sort of a, a victim of the bilateral. Uh, uh, renegotiation that the Trump administration uh, wants to pursue, because the WTO is a big obstacle to these uh, uh, renegotiations, because uh, if you get out of NAFTA, you will be uh, confronted by the bound uh, tariffs of Mexico, or if you renegotiate with Korea, that actually put the U.S. at a very big disadvantage. So how to get rid of that uh, little dilemma? Great Thank questions. Um, so who would like to start? I thought I was going to volunteer you against Scott, but thank you. <laughs> All right. So uh, in terms of uh, public goods, I mean, I think China has decided that it's important to provide public goods in a variety of different global governance institutions. Um, and uh, it's uh, staked um, a lot of its credibility on, on doing so at the WTO. Uh, there's a growing number of staff members who are from China. The, one of the deputy director generals is Chinese, one of the m members of the appellate body. Um, China has uh, started you know, the Belt and Road Initiative. This Sunday, there'll be a monster meeting in Beijing with 28 heads of state, 110 countries to support the Belt and Road, which is consistent with the WTO principles. They've explicitly emphasized that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, China is still yet to provide uh, public goods that cost it a lot. So that, that's the challenge. And the most important public good that China could provide would be more access to it, more consistent access to its markets. So, uh, sh and so that's why uh, when Xi Jinping speaks in Davos or other places and defends globalization, uh, it sounds uh, su strong, to, helpful to some, but hollow to others. And, and so when, as soon as China is willing to do that, and it's not, you know, uh, if looking from the outside, you know, no one's crying for Chinese exports, right? Because China's the world's largest exporter. On the other hand, if you're in China and you're facing these interests, which you mentioned, and the challenges of, of uh, slower growth, and you're facing the leadership transition of the 19th Party Congress, you, you, you don't want, and state-owned enterprise problems, you don't want to give more market access. And if folks aren't going to walk from the WTO, if they're not going to bring a lot of uh, unilateral sanctions against you, then you feel that you actually have a little bit of room so I, I still think that we're not quite there to where China is willing to make that. 
um, if you had a deft Washington and others who could creatively, effectively, nimbly, uh, smartly, intelligently use some of these uh, tools to know just how much to push. Um, and if China felt that if it didn't, not only would it face diplomatic costs, but businesses would start stop using China as part of the global production network, then I think you'd get changes. I'm just not so com super confident that Washington has the, that current skill set. Lorraine? Yeah, so on the uh, uh, how the WTO might be impacted by the bilateralist policy of the United States, uh, well, as you know, uh, uh, in the case of Mexico, indeed, the breakup of NAFTA would mean United States accepting that Mexico uh, practices MFN applied tariffs to it, which means a big escalation in in uh, in, in tariffs, much bigger than the United States can place on Mexico. So that obviously would be a, <laughs> a source of friction. Hopefully, it will also be a deterrent uh, uh, for the United States from exiting NAFTA, which would be a crazy thing to do in the first place. Uh, uh, in terms of the other big three, uh, Japan and Germany, uh, uh, Japan and Germany have big bilateral surpluses with the United States. But their MFN tariffs are also very low, OK? So I don't see that as being a, a big issue. In the case of China, uh, there is no free trade agreement between uh, China and the United States. And, uh, and so the issue there is, uh, is much more complex. But I have to say that uh, uh, you know, I've listened carefully to the discussion in China on the panel. and. Uh, and elsewhere in many places. And it's amazing to me how people lose the big picture. Uh, because the big picture is that uh, the, US, uh, the uh, Chinese current account surplus has declined from about 10% of GDP a few years ago uh, to about 2.5% of GDP uh, last year. Similarly, the US current account deficit has declined for other reasons. Uh, the uh, 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 China is uh, trying to prevent its currency from depreciating, uh, not appreciating. That's the history, okay? And so you can lose yourself in the, in the, in the details of the non-tariff barriers, which are indeed an issue, and I think they're a legitimate issue uh, to go after, and the United States, and not only the United States, should go after them for that. Uh, you can lose yourself in the weeds, and lose sight of the history of the reorientation of the Chinese economy towards uh, uh, domestic demand, which we have seen in recent years. You can lose sight of the fact that the Chinese played an extraordinarily positive role during the financial crisis because of a massive stimulus program that helped everybody. Uh, and also, you can lose sight of the future. And the future is very simple. Uh, China is headed to being the world's largest trading nation by a very wide margin over the next 20 years. It will be uh, the biggest export market for virtually every country of the world over the next 20 years. And so uh, as we worry about uh, uh, the non-tariff barriers, the impediments which uh, we need to, uh, we certainly need to work on, we also need to <coughs> bear in mind the fact that there is virtually nothing that the international community will be able to do uh, in terms of providing global public goods, a stable and open and predictable trading system, investment system, uh, climate, I could name any number of uh, areas uh, without cooperation between China and the United States. Well, I certainly wish I could keep you all here all afternoon and uh, mm -hmm. continue this conversation, which is really so rich and interesting. But unfortunately, our time is up. If you can please join me in thanking the panelists for today. Thank you. Thank you.